Radio 4. Do come in. Don't knock. And don't knock so loudly either. Did I knock too loudly for your sensitive, pearly ears? You've heard nothing yet. Behave, slave. We rule this wave. Of you we are unafraid. We pay your wages. Put down the tray and come here. The Autonomous Murder Complex by Frederick Bradnam with Robin Ellis as Harry Meadows. Ravages are my wages. Oh, look, I've broken my wages. As I'll break you both. You've let the genius out of the bottle, silly cows. You don't know what you're up against. <laughs> now, let me escort you from the room. To the bedroom. This way, please. Come along. Thank you, slave. Ah! No, no, no. Down you go. Ah! <laughs> Just a matter of a few floorboards missing and down into the pit they go. And no one will know that I did it. No one. <laughs> That's the sort of thing. Terribly real at the time, Doctor. You English are so bad with names, Mr. Meadows. Hilda Geertsen. I think you should call me Hilda. And I call you Harry, yes? Fair enough. Hilda and Harry. <laughs> we should make the palladium. Ah, that is a joke, I see. Not a very funny one. Sorry. So you write them down. Uh, the dreams, not the jokes. Read me another. All right. Do you think... I think nothing yet. Read me another ugly man dream. The chap, ugly man, was lurking behind a hedge or wall. As things do in dreams, it changed. The grounds were a bit like those at Rushforth Park, a place I know. The chap was watching a piece of land which he had trapped in some way, mined it or dug pits, and it was a fine day. They should be arriving soon, galloping their horses. What a surprise they'll have. What a surprise. The inquest will ask, who did it? Who indeed? The enemy from over the border? The trusted gardener? The neighbors. I shall sit in the courtroom wearing black as the friend who mourns and laugh inside. <laughs> Listen. Ah, here they come. As usual, I woke up before anything happened. This ugly chap is all bull, all talk. Yes, but his own sort of bull, as you call it. Uh, tell me now uh, of yourself, Harry. I was wondering when you'd ask that. I thought psychoanalysts began with one's history. Why should we? That's only relevant if you're a real case, something we wish to sink our teeth into. Ah, yes, indeed. So come and sit in the chair now. <laughs> How old are you? Forty-two. And for a living? Ah. Up to six months ago, I was a soldier. Been so since I was nineteen. A soldier? You, you surprised me. An officer? Yes, since military academy. I'm a lieutenant colonel. I commanded an infantry battalion. And now you have left the army. For what reason? Good question. Uh... A number of reasons. I had had enough. 
saw no point in serving anymore. It was very unlikely that I'd get promotion, so I'd have to take my bowler hat. Uh, as we say, in a year or so, so why not now? And my last tour of duty wasn't a success either. Do you now do something else? No, not yet. I haven't got round to it. I'm in a pickle. Truth is... God, this is awful. I, I want to cry. Then cry. <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, I don't cry. <laughs> it's like some hovering schoolboy. <laughs> the last time I cried was... <sighs> Can't talk about it. I'm so sorry. I... <sighs> Makes you feel better, in fact. Like they say. <laughs> Truth is, uh, my life is a bloody nonsense. <sighs> Fallen apart. It's hard to explain. Your last tour of duty wasn't the success, you said. Can you tell me of this tour of duty? Yes. Um what isn't covered by the Official Secrets Act. It was the battalion's second visit to Northern Ireland in three years. The first wasn't too bad. The second go was a sheer catastrophe. I lost ten chaps in one ambush. Two weeks later, another four on the street in a week. Then um, my second in command and three of my best NCOs in one armoured truck were blown sky high. All this in three months. So we were pulled out. I was moved to a staff job at NATO, relieved of my command, in fact. So I sent in my papers, and they were accepted. I sort of slunk out. Were you yourself wounded or injured? No. Not a scratch. Do you believe the catastrophe, as you call it, was your fault? I don't know. I've chewed it over. God, have I not. Do you think there is such a thing as pure and simple bad luck? Why not? I have come across it. <laughs> Pride must have a fall, right? I was proud. Vainly proud? Not proud enough, perhaps. Had I set things in motion in such a way that they'd turn against me? I can't see that I did. I can see that I'd lost my grip a bit, though. I had become a bit remote, I suppose. And a battalion commander can't be even slightly remote. At least not under the conditions of the Ulster War, he can't. Perhaps if I'd been more on the ball, I could have prevented some of the beastliness. I don't know, but... Because I wasn't spot on the ball, when the bad luck rolled in, it swept me away. Do I make sense? A type of sense, yes. Mm. I suppose it was because I was unburdening my dreams on you that I wanted to cry. You did cry also. Why, I am not sure. But let us keep to your history and not sidetrack. My last tour of duty wasn't a success either. But to what does that either refer? To the whole shooting match. Making a general nonsense of things. Personal failure. Are you married, Harry? And there's that. I married 15 years ago. We divorced by mutual consent five years ago. We have a daughter of 13. Do you see your daughter? Now and again, by kind permission of her mother. And her? Uh, your ex-wife, do you still see her? Oh, yes. In a way, we're quite good pals. <laughs> she considers me a bit of a joke, has for a long time. I married above my station as we used to say. I suppose that makes her feel superior. Do you mean that she is of a higher class than you? You know what class is in England. I came from the lower middle. My dad was a local council clerk. I married Lady Monica Grant, the daughter of an earl. So it was Captain Meadows and Lady Monica. 
who happens to be Mrs. Meadows. Well, tell me something of your marriage. God knows why I ever thought it could have worked. I don't think Monica believed it ever would. She's a very, uh, how can I put it, physical, passionate, strongly sexed lady. And she had a sexual crush on me. So did I on her, only not so much. But you can't keep that sort of thing up forever. <laughs> if you'll excuse the innuendo. I suppose we had a good run for our money. Has she remarried? Funnily enough, she hasn't. I don't know what she does for male company. She lives at home and there's no evidence of lovers there. Not when I visit, at least. Does it worry you, the idea of lovers? <laughs> good Lord, no. Although I am concerned for patients, my daughter's feelings. Lovers all over Rushforth Park when she's there would not be a good thing, would it? Oh, children suffer far worse at come through. Uh, Rushforth Park is a large house? Very. A sort of castle. Monica's father is dead, her mother not. She really does despise me, always has. She's the Dowager Countess. And she lives at Rushforth along with the present Earl and his family. There's plenty of room. Monica and Mary, her mum, have a wing to themselves. Self-contained. And you visit this place still? When Patience is on holiday. I have to. It's the only way I can get to see her. And even then it isn't plain sailing. The last time was a couple of months ago. The Dowager Countess and Lady Monica will be down in a few minutes. They told me to say so. Thanks, Abwell. How are things? Fine, Colonel, thank you. Still fitting in all right? I hope so, sir. Is Miss Patience about? I don't know, sir. You haven't seen her? No, sir. I believe she's with the Bartons at Mallet, sir. I see. Thanks, Atwell. Keep up the good work. I'll do my best, sir. Atwell isn't important, but you may as well know about him. He was the officer's mess sergeant of my outfit. Came out after 12 years. I recommended him to the Dowager Countess. He'd been at Rushforth for about six months as underbutler. Good-looking chap. Thought rather too much of himself. Uh, there you are, Harry. We'll meet to the window, will you, Monica? Got a job yet, Harry? Does it concern you, Monica? Do sit down, Harry. You're not on parade, are you? No, ex-mother-in-law. No longer. No more parades, indeed. Or did you mean something more subtle? Not me, Mary. You know me. You should get a job, Harry. Can't be good for you. Just lounging around all day. Doesn't seem to do many of your crowd much harm, does it? <laughs> and you never understood about them. The roses need deadheading badly. I suppose you're wondering where Patience has got to. As I came specifically to see her, yes. Well, she should be back in about an hour, didn't she say, Monica? Well, that's what she hoped. You did tell her I was coming? Of course. She'd already made plans. That means you told her last thing, the usual trick. <laughs> I can't imagine why you have this excessive disposition to filial affection, Harry. Do the middle classes always support this behaviour? I don't know. I'm lower middle, remember? And for Christ's sake, don't lay it on so thick. I want to give the child some love. Someone has to, and I don't believe either of you know how. It's something you weren't brought up to know about. You can't show. Don't be a bloody fool, Harry. Patience is perfectly happy, both here and at school. She behaves as if she is, which is good behaviour and no more. But the girl is a child. Thirteen, Mary. They go on the pill at thirteen. <laughs> What they get up to in the lower depths <laughs> is of no concern to us. God, how I hate you, both of you. Oh, must you? Let us preserve the decencies, please. And you don't hate us. We don't hate each other in our world. Shall I have tea, sir, my lady? Oh, yes, do, Atwell. Have some tea with us, Harry. Patience will be back by half five, I'm sure. Is it as bad as that? I've given you the basics, but it is. In Danish, we say factor. <laughs> Antics, playing games. Yes, but their game is not my game, if I have a game. It was of them I was speaking. 
They are the game-playing sort. You, Harry, I do not think you play games. You are a man without a private mask, I think. Is that a compliment? Is it a good thing to be? <laughs> it is a compliment in a way. It is not a good thing to be, no. So, why do I dream these awful dreams? We shall try to find out. If we find out, will it heal? Ah, that is the mercy which we see. This frightful chap I dream, as if I am him and he is me. Where does he come from? Who is he? Why does he take over like he does? Is he one side, the bad side? You have heard of Carl Gustav Jung, yes? The psychologist. The chap. psychologist chap. Let us go into the unconscious, Harry. <laughs> like going into a minefield without a map, isn't it? Good. True. But there are parts which have been mapped. Some twist and turn and are made uh, by their own imminent rules, of which we know very little, although we do know of the parts. Made by their own volition. So it seems. Jung called these parts complexes. And these particular complexes, which seem to exist in isolation in the unconscious, he called autonomous complexes. Hmm. You mean, while other complexes relate to each other, like paths that cross, these autonomous ones don't? Roughly, yes. You see, all this that I tell you is only an approximation. Oh, there are books, many books. The complications are immense. So much so that I would rather you did not read any such books at present. All right. I'll stick to Anthony Powell. So these autonomous complexes throw up figures, images, in various ways. They can also invade the conscious personality and turn a person mad or make him believe in his destiny so strongly that he becomes his destiny, but still often mad. He becomes possessed. It also, unfortunately, makes for persons to behave with great foolishness more often than not. A folie de grandeur sometimes. Politicians, for example, frequently suffer from this possession. I've noticed. Now, in literature, Raskolnikov, crime and punishment is a good example. Dostoevsky understood that Raskolnikov's belief that a man is not a whole man unless he can take the life of another without compunction is foolish and pathetic and mad. I think I understand. Uh, am I in danger of being invaded? No. No, no. Your autonomous complex is more interesting, more rare. It has produced a shadow ego figure, a figure lurking deep, deep down among the rubbish of repressions, anxieties, hates and fears. A negative and dark figure, the secret side of your ego, but part of your whole personality, that which makes you a whole man. But why this shadow ego figure should appear with such clarity, such power, I don't know. It is what we must find out. Now, when did these dreams first begin, did you say? No. Two months ago, about. Immediately after I last visited Rushforth Park, actually short dream. The nasty chap was gloating about having sent everybody off in wrong directions. I think he was there in Rushforth in a small room. Yes, he, he could use Rushforth as a plank, a springboard. Well, uh, our next session is on Friday. Uh, <coughs> you must make a note of your dreams, please. I will. Tell me, could this figure... Let us call him Horrible Harry. H.H. for short. <laughs> Spot on. Could Horrible Harry cause this Harry 
to do any harm. It is unlikely, except to yourself. There are mass projections of this shadow figure. They produce religious bigotry, the treatment of other races as subhuman, inferior. Do you have such feelings consciously? Against the Irish, perhaps? No, I rather like them. Uh, of course, there is the Dowager Countess, her sort. <laughs> She is an unlikely candidate. Oh, oh, I'm tired now. I go old, you know. Until our next meeting. He's not here. Look behind the wall. Where could he have got to? He's vanished into thin air. He was only an old tramp. I thought he was a clergyman. He was a priest. <laughs> a cardinal. He chased the little girls, whatever he was. There, I have swept them away. They would not have found me in a month of Sundays. Fools, I am their shadow, creeping up on little girls. Or disguised, I am upright and clerical, the last man they'd imagine to harbor such lusts. But I saw you! <laughs> I should drown you. <laughs> Take you and drown you. <laughs> I couldn't drown him, Hilda. Couldn't move to him. Why? Self-preservation. You could have been in trouble if you had drowned him. He's part of me, of course, I see that. Yea, he may have taken you down with him. What do we know about him? Two things stand out, yes. He is very pleased with himself, and he's very confident. Quite the opposite from you in both aspects, yes? Too bloody true. Burn! Burn! Monstrous regiment of women! What are your battalions now worth? This is the war of the sexes, the seven-day war. I've set fire to your hive, a blaze of barracks. And they'll wonder whom it was who struck the match. That paid them out, burnt them out, and paid them out. Serves them right. I'll teach them to ignore me. <laughs> what can we make of that, I wonder? <laughs> H.H. seems to have it in for the girls. They are a regiment, a battalion, yes. Your soldiers? You resent the way the army treated you, but do you resent women in general? Certainly not. Not in general. One thing, Hilda. When H.H. is up to his tricks, I'm there also, every time watching him openly. He doesn't appear to see me, or if he does, he ignores me. Is there a drift of sorts there? <laughs> He's too conceited to acknowledge your presence. And, of course, you are no threat to him. Fair enough. Of course, he's still not been seen actually doing anything, has he? Only claiming he's done things or waiting for them to happen. I know. I wonder if he will do something, and if he does, why? Today, I am the Invisible Hulk, the Black Death who will clutch at their throats until they are dead. There's no protection from him. I shall leave no trace of my revenge. You will see the trail of dead will be like those struck down by an unknown doom. Here we go. You would not know, but Nietzsche had similar dreams. He went mad, didn't he? Are you feeling all right, Hilda? Uh, tired. And, and I have some pain, but let us go on. Now, this is interesting. H.H. is a revenge symbol, yes? against all the slights you've received, the small persecutions, the manner in which the army failed you, the treatment you receive at Rashford's Park, yes? I suppose so. But 
there is something more, which is exciting, yes. H.H. looks ahead to what is to happen often. Often as if he knows the future. He prophesizes. Yes, this is unusual. Oh, oh. Hilda, what's the matter? Oh, oh. The, the pain is different this time. Goodbye, Harry. Oh, my God. Hilda? Someone! Quickly! I thought it better to talk here, Colonel Meadows, and not the consulting room, which may have seemed I was taking over from Hilda. And you're not? Well, that's up to you. Poor Hilda. I feel... Well, she hadn't been well for some time. She knew the warning signs, but she chose to ignore them. I feel as if I've killed her. A massive heart seizure killed her. She always said she'd work until the end. She was 75. Without her, I feel quite lost, you know. Dr... Uh, Joanna White. Sorry, Joanna White. I'll remember. This terrible chap I dream about. Horrible Harry, we called him. It's as if he's out to ruin everything and is successful. I have read Hilda's notes. Hilda's death was the last thing I thought would happen. Yes, we analysts rarely go down dead in full flight. She said there was such a thing as pure bad luck. I have it and it killed her. You're not a man who goes in for self-pity usually, are you? No. Nor was I go in for tears, but I cried like a schoolboy with her. With me, you would be allowed a small ration of self-pity and a few tears. Uh, that is, if you wish to continue the analysis. Sometime, yes. But not for the moment. I, I have to have a pause. Sorry. No, I understand. But I'm sure you'll need to continue. So please, do go on writing your dreams down. Yes, of course. <laughs> it's becoming second nature. Yes, it does. Have you friends to whom you can talk about Hilda's death? No, not really. I kept my visits to myself. There is my ex-wife, of course. Better her than no one, I suppose. I say, Daddy, you don't look at all well. I'm all right, Patty. Had a bit of a shock the other day. It took the wind out of my sails. That's the stuff, Aswell. Park me under the sycamore by Lady Monica. Ah, and now go and get some drinks. Yes, my lady. What sort of shock, Daddy? Somebody died suddenly at my feet, as it were. What's this, Harry? I didn't think you were listening, Monica. With half an ear? Who died? A very nice elderly lady died when I was with her. How terrible. Who was she, Daddy? Did I hear you talking of her death, Harry? You did, Mary, but of nobody known to you. <laughs> well, do go on. Who was she? A doctor from Denmark. Unusual for you. Most unusual. What the hell were you doing with elderly Danish lady doctors? Playing bridge? Holding tea parties. Did you like her, Daddy? Yes, very much, Patty. How did it happen? She had a heart attack. Bad one. You see, she was a fine person. You haven't answered Monica's question, Harry. I know. I wonder what you'll make of it. Make of what? Harry, you're not cut out to be enigmatic. She was a psychoanalyst, and I was consulting her. Well, well. That's a turn up for the books. And when she died, you were on her couch. I suppose she did have a couch. Yes, and yes. All our American girls have their analysts. Your father is somewhat different, Patience. Well, he could have problems. Thank you, Patty. Well, perhaps it would be best if we don't hear about them. But no. On the other hand, knowing you, Harry, it is tantalising. I have certain dreams. Oh, defy, Harry. I thought, um, Jane, your American friend, very nice, Patty. Ah, oh, thank you, Atwell. Well, put them down there. I'll look after things. Thank you, Lady Monica. The soft drink for Miss Patience is ice cold, I'm afraid. Never mind. It'll soon warm up this evening. It will, Miss. And I've brought some Angostura bitters for the Colonel. Is that all, my lady? Indeed it is, Atwell. Thank you. Is he proving satisfactory? Atwell? Oh, yes. Very. I can't stand him. Too bad. <laughs> Why did you ask? 
I just feel responsible for him, that's all. He has learned his duties very quickly. So, you went to this lady from Denmark and told her your dreams. That's about it. It sounds as if they were too much for her. Mummy, you can be so cruel. Heartless more than cruel, Patty. Oh, that's me. Certain dreams, Harry. Don't we all have certain dreams? Or do you mean they are of a sexual nature? No, not that. Yes, we all have our own certain dreams, but surprisingly enough, there are types and patterns of dreams which are very common. I bet you've never had a common dream, Grandmama. Cheeky brat. I sometimes dream of being a girl again, riding horses not stuck in this damn chair. Mm. That is understandable. My dreams were disturbing. Sort of nightmares, do you mean? More real. They remain with me. They don't fade out, vanish. Well, well. Fancy you, Harry. As you said, a turn up for the books. Were your dreams about leaving the army? Of course they weren't, child. You're right. How are you so sure? Well, I don't think you felt guilty about leaving the army, Harry. A little bitter, maybe. But I think you were glad to get out, so why should you have disturbing dreams about it? Fair enough. We were trying to discover what caused the dreams when Hilda died. It was complicated. <laughs> You'd better come out with it, Harry. What sort of dreams? An autonomous complex. My dear boy, of what? Well, I'll tell you. An autonomous complex is a twisting of things in the deep unconscious, which in my case has thrown up a shadow ego figure. <laughs> the dark, secret side of myself, actually. A very nasty, evil bloke who spends his time creating havoc, murdering people and being pleased about it. He's known as Horrible Harry... After his brother. Like Cain and Abel. Oh, poor Daddy. How really horrible. It's like someone walking over one's grave. It seems to me to make you a more interesting man than I thought you were in the past. You would say that. I, I might have guessed. I suppose you could be capable of murder, Harry. If roused. It's not me who murders, Monica. I'm not the type. He is. Well, we all of us have a dark side to us, don't we? Only it's very firmly sat upon, isn't it? <laughs> it is, Patty. Even in the unconscious. So, when it rears its ugly head in those depths, as powerfully as in my case, one has to find out why. Or else damage can be done. Oh, damage? In what way? Or to whom? To the dreamer's personality. To my life, Mary. What do you do now? No, now your analyst is dead. If the dreams continue, then I go to another analyst and continue. Well, that woman dying in the middle of things can't have helped. It left me pretty numb. I, I felt it was my fault. When was this, Daddy? Oh, a week ago. Seems an age. You'd better try to get over it, Harry. Go off and do something outrageous. That might quell your nasty friend. I wish I could. No. It's not in Harry's nature. Not outrage. Hence the dreams, I imagine. I wouldn't like to live with them. They make you look over your shoulder. Well, what's that Will doing, taking the chairs in? How on earth should I know? Well, I thought you might. Did you now? Yes. Anyway, thanks for your sympathy. I didn't expect it. Why not? I'm not all that bloody. In fact, the whole thing gives me a, a cold spine for you. All I beg is, for, for God's sake, get it sorted out. Well, you don't want to go dotty, do you? Not you, Harry. Some men do spend all their lives working at it, but no, you're not the sort. Oh, hang on to my sanity, Mary. Now, Patty was going to take me to see the new puppies. Shall we go? Yes, lovely. Won't be long. Where are they? Well, they're over here in the stables. They're very alike, those two. I wouldn't have expected it. And you must stop Atwell hanging around, Monica. I know. He's becoming a bore. <laughs> see? We haven't touched the drinks. Let us remember the fallen. Remember, remember this 94th of November, those who fell in two wars. Died for us, which was noble of them. Died so we might live in pieces. Let us remember them, the fallen. Nonsense! Hypocrisy! Rubbish! Ball! Get that man! Police! That red! That disturber of the Queen's peace! We all know who he is, don't we? Yes, we do! The police are moving in on him. They will lock him up, or better still, send him back to where he came from, the lower depths, the dark house, the black shed, the bottom of the garden. One, two, three, you won't catch me. Ah, here 
here she is. The Lady Mayor, representing her gracious mediocrity, attended by her daughter, who represents our Princess of the Month. Six pages of poses in penthouse. The Lady Mayor was herself wounded in the last war, while leading the last charge of the Lancers on the road to Mandalay. She will now lay the wrath to the fallen at the memorial to the gluttonous dead, pushed in her chair by her daughter. As they remain at the memorial in silence, a figure approaches. He walks with quiet deliberation, a tall, dignified man wearing a long black cloak, a foreign diplomat for sure. Now he goes over to the Lady Mayor, bends over her for a few words. Now he turns to her daughter, places his cloak around her in a grand gesture. What has happened? The Lady Mayor falls from her chair. The daughter slumps to the ground. There is blood everywhere. They are slain. They have fallen. They are the glorious dead. Who was the assassin? The man in the long black cloak? Where is he? The crowd surge up to the dead at the memorial. There is pandemonium, chaos, panic, and the assassin is nowhere to be seen. Who was he? Who was he who fulfilled our hopes and our desires, our dreams and our wishes? Who said I never did anything? This is only a beginning. Wait and see, and they won't catch me. There it is, Dr. White. And it ended with that march. Colonel Bogey, yes. Daft, isn't it? And some of it is rather obvious, isn't it? Like the assassin, it's cloaked with the obvious. It was also pretty intricate. My regiment was once the 94th of foot. So we have the 94th of November for the celebration of what is no longer part of your life. Mm. And the dead? The images and statements of dreams are often very stark. The past is dead, and so on. Also, you have no unconscious desires to kill your ex-wife and her mother, but you probably do have the unconscious desire to have nothing more to do with them. Mm. It would be best if they were also no longer part of your life although that's impossible. A really fresh start. It could be that that's what horrible Harry is up to. Some things fall into place if you see it like that. To start afresh, you need to change, among other things. To change, you need to understand another side of yourself, cultivate it even. Dr. White, may I call you Joanna? Oh, please, I'd like that, Harry. Joanna. Joanna, you're not suggesting I become at all like H.H. <laughs> Perish the thought. No, perhaps more ruthless than you are. Ah. Well, look at it like this. You grew up as a man in the army, with all that that implies. Part of a closed society, a world of its own, a club. Loyal to one another, so far as the rest of society was concerned. Loyal to queen and country. H.H. also killed the queen figure, didn't he? Mm. Now you're out on your own after 20 years or more. Out of the hive, the barracks, the security of the order of soldiery. Whether you know it or not, it's given your ego one hell of a wallop. So, to begin again, you must change. And the change must come from inside you deep down, from the unconscious where H.H. lurks. If you don't change, you'll become a silly old buffer type, an anachronism out of your depth. So H.H. has been killing the past? Let's say it's a theory worth exploring. One thing, though. H.H. didn't come into a dream until after I'd left the army for some four months. They actually started, as I told dear Hilda, shortly after a particular visit to Rushforth, the first for some time. There's always a trigger, often quite a small thing, which stirs the complex. Rushforth Park is the past. It's only the present still because of your daughter, which makes it worse. You're tied to the place because of her, so you resent it. Not her. But because of her, you can't openly deal with your resentment. That makes sense. I know. 
That's what worries me about it. Anyway, we'll give it a twist next time. Oh, before mm. you go, Harry, tell me, do you lead a very lonely life, day by day? Good Lord, no. I live alone, as you know. No one girl. Not much in the way of girls anyway. My choice, that. Well, I don't feel lonely. I only feel rather free. For once, I have no responsibilities. I have a good few friends whom I see quite a bit of. <laughs> Round the corner from my billet is a slightly disreputable drinking club. The sort of place I couldn't ever have belonged to before. Hmm. Full of actors and actresses, gamblers, retired villains, some writers and composers, and a number of ladies without visible means of support. Hmm. Evening, Colonel. Had a good day? All right, Alf. Took a lot of exercise, at least. Find my usual, please, Doris. Be with you in a jet, Colonel. She had oh, flat feet and a fur coat. Would you have an agent with flat feet and a fur coat? <laughs> Real mother figure. Evening, Harry. Evening, Michael. Oh, you be careful, Colonel. Exercise can be bad for the old ticker. <laughs> and what do you know about exercise, Alf, except some indoor activities without cards? Cards? Bed, you mean, Diana? <laughs> I was trying to avoid the obvious. With Alf, only the obvious counts. <laughs> Thanks, Doris. Thanks. Anyway, I can't remember so far back. Years since I played cards. <laughs> um, uh, did uh, any of you see that playlet on the beam last night? No. Well, who can I conduct a conversation about it with, hmm? That isn't very good grammar, is it? What do you expect? He writes things. <laughs> I didn't see you yesterday. No? Wasn't I here yesterday? Lunchtime, wasn't I? What did I do yesterday? What exercise does for you. Gives you amnesia. <laughs> <laughs> do shut up, Al. I thought you said you'd be here in the evening. Is that the evening paper, Doris? It is, but hand it back when you've read it. No, don't I always? Did I, Diana? I don't remember. I, I went to dinner at some friends. Sorry, it was a long-standing invitation. It didn't matter. Only that I got landed with that beautiful young man who once played the lead in a Ken Russell film. Oh, he's heartbreaking. After two hours, he's mind-blowing. I'm sorry. I don't know what's the matter with me, but I'm becoming awfully forgetful. Absented from the mind. I suppose it's lack of responsibility doing it. You need a job, Harry. When you're out of work, it goes like that. So my ex-wife tells me. <laughs> I mean that I need a job. Here, here, Colonel. Don't you know a place called Rashford Park? I do, Al. I thought you mentioned it at one time. I could have done. Why? There'd been a murder there. Double murder. What? The Dowager Countess of Bradlam... And her daughter, Lady Monica Grant, were found dead this morning at their home, Rushforth Park, near Maidstone. It is understood that they died of knife wounds. Police won't say no more at this juncture. Says... Harry, do you know them? Let me see them. They're right, you are. They're photos and all. Are, are they friends of yours? Yes. Friends, I, I knew them. I knew them very well. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I must do some phoning, among other things. I thought he was going over. If I'd known him, I'd have read it out. Not your fault, Alf. I wonder what they are to him. I don't know. But close, very close. I bet my shirt on it. Mm. I seem to recall that he... Excuse me, Alf. I think I'll make a phone call, too. Housemistress, uh, I wanted the head. No, 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 you'll do. I'm Colonel Meadows, father of Patience. Yes, Patience Meadows. Uh, no, you, no, you don't know me. Yes, I could be anybody. Well, I quite understand. Lady Monica, well, that would be difficult. Look, will you listen to me, woman? Something has happened. Something has happened to Patience's mother and grandmother, the Dowager Countess. An accident, yes. Well, it's a bit more than unfortunate. They've been found murdered. Yes, murdered. Well, how the hell do I know who did it? All I want you or your headmistress to do is to tell Patience the news before she hears it accidentally. I know it's not a nice task, but it's, it's what you're there for. Then get her to ring me. 01-246-8091.
Thank you. Silly cow. Damn, who the hell's that? Where's my flaming revolver? Can we have a word, Colonel Meadows? Who the hell are you, first? Uh, my name's Stanitz, and this is Judith Smart. This is a bad time to call, for whatever reason. What do you want with me, anyway? Uh, we'd rather not talk in the corridor. Are you the police? Oh, were you expecting the police, Colonel Meadows? Perhaps, but you're not them. Tell me what you want of me, and I might let you in. And do put your hands on top of your head. What the hell? Yeah. Up, Stanitz, if that's your name, and you, Smart. Oh, crikey, he's bombing. Maybe he'll not. He's got a revolver. Now, come into the hall. I'd rather the neighbours didn't see. Oh, God help us. Oh, hmm. Say so you were harmless. Got anything to identify yourselves by? Well, in my handbag, my NUJ card. The tidiest handbag I've seen for a long time. Ah, so, you're reporters. Do put your hands down. Oh. oh. Sorry about that, but you see, I did command a battalion for two tours of duty in Northern Ireland, not so long ago. Precautions, as they say, are worthwhile. Oh, I thought my last hour had come. You got here very fast, haven't you? Oh, it was luck. Somebody phoned us. Diana, I'll wring her neck. Which paper are you from? Uh, the Sunday Citizen. I never read it. Well, I don't think I can tell you anything. I've only just heard the news myself. No, it isn't about the murder, Colonel Meadows. Our, our business is about the victims. What life was like at the... the, the, the where was it? Oh, Rush something Park. Yeah. Rush forth, Mr Thanet, which is what is likely to happen to you. An inside story. We give you 3,000 for three columns. I'm afraid you've got the wrong man. Look, we do it discreetly, Colonel. A shocked ex-husband, that sort of thing. Know you know that my store doesn't do such things. Well, they do, you know, if the money's right. Uh, 5,000, Colonel. <laughs> What a disgusting world you represent. Two million readers every Sunday. That is no excuse. I'll have no part of it. Good evening to you both. Oh, come on, old lad. You're being self-righteous. Out. Nothing else. Out, Thanet. Mm. Smart out. Oh, come on, Thanet. Leave it. I don't trust his temper anymore. Look, the paper would go up to 10,000. God help the self-righteous. Put the gun away. I felt, I actually felt capable of killing them. And what could I tell them? Who did murder them? Who in heaven's name? Hello? Ah, patience. Patty, darling, have they told you? What? N no, no, Patty. Um, I'm afraid that's not quite true. They have an well, it wasn't an accident. The newspaper headline said murdered. Murdered? Yes, darling. Who did it? Well, nobody's been arrested yet. I, I, I can't believe it. I know, I know. It'll take time to sink in. I don't feel it's quite true myself. Listen, darling, you may have reporters on the school doorstep. They've already been here. Did you ask them? No, no. Somebody told them. Somebody could tell them about you. For money, my love. That's our world. Tell the headmistress. Yeah, okay. By the way, is your housemistress feeble-minded? Yes. She is, but not the head. She's all right. Good. Give it a few days, and I'll come down and collect you, and we'll go into hiding. Oh, poor mummy. Yes, I know. Poor mummy. Poor old granny. I, I think I'm going to cry. Yes, go and have a good cry. Me too. I'll ring you. Of course I love you. Bless you. Police next. Try to find out where. Scotland Yard, where else? Colonel Meadows? Uh, yes. Ah, I'm Inspector Oakes. Do sit down. Uh, they told me of your problem downstairs. How can I help? Tell me more than I know. It's not just ghoulish interest. Well, I didn't imagine it was. Were you still in touch with your ex-wife? Well, we have a daughter of 13, and to see her, I would visit Rushforth. So I remained in contact both with my ex and with her mother. I saw them only a few weeks ago. Where is your daughter, sir? Boarding school in the depths of the country. What can you tell me? Well, the local force are handling it, sir. They haven't asked us for our help. Probably they have a local suspect, or they may just be being possessive. You mean I have to go there to find out? Or they'll dig you out, sir. Yes, 
I suppose they may. I rang them a moment ago. They're being very cagey. Anything I tell you, they ask that you keep it to yourself. I shall, never fear. Well, they told me that the murders took place sometime after 23 hours yesterday. Lady Monica was found in her bedroom. The Dowager Countess outside in the corridor near the bedroom. In her wheelchair? She was more or less crippled. Was she? Well, they didn't say. They were both killed by one wound to the heart. The same on each body. A skillful job, it seems. They were found by the staff in the morning. Well, that's all, sir. It's not much, is it? They don't say how the killer got in? Not a word, sir. Well, perhaps he was already in or was let in. Yes, of course. Well, I'll give you my address, should anyone wish to see me. Thanks for your help, anyway. Oh, not at all, sir. You, uh, you have my sympathy. Things will take their course with this one, I think. It's the kind of case which leaves uh, little to the imagination. Do come in, Colonel Lorne. Meadows. We've been expecting you, sir. Keeping the bodies warm. Cold. In the west wing, laid out. For inspection. The other gentleman took the wheelchair, sir. Raced in it, down the corridor. He's such a character. Always up to some trick. Come in, dear boy, come in. What a wonderful scene of carnage, eh? What went on in the kitchen, eh? Not an unbroken utensil to be seen. They didn't expect it, you know, but they deserved it, richly. Bare-faced, bearing hearts, and so on. They should have expected it, dear boy. The signs were all there. Of course, as we both know, signs have to be interpreted as best one can, taken as omens. So there it is. And do take the knife with you. It is yours. You recall when they gave it to you, I'm sure. It's more of a short bayonet than a knife, isn't it? Well, I'm wheelchairing away. Cheerio. This way, Colonel. Do be careful how you tread, sir. There are things in the corridor. Cadavers. Carrion. Mortal remains. Cold flesh. And behind that door, sir. A sad fate. What is worse than death? No, sir, don't go in. Don't go in. Not again, sir. You'll only live to regret it. You have opened the door, sir. So now you'll have to see what you did. And that will make you scream, <laughs> sir. I woke screaming. I wonder why the kitchens? It goes with the two servant figures, guardians of the dead. The kitchen was the Rushforth one, but does it matter? Everything matters, Harry. I dream of two women, substitutes for my ex and her mother, being murdered by my shadow ego figure. We unraveled that, more or less. A few weeks later, the real women are murdered, stabbed to death. As in the dream. It appears, Harry, that your shadow ego, old H.H., enjoys the gift of prophecy. There are such things as prophetic dreams, of course, but connected with an autonomous complex, most rare, unheard of even. I'll tell you how H.H. became a prophet. He took me over, got me to carry out the prophecy. Got you? I did the murders. I am the murderer. Stared me in the face since last night's dream. I became H.H. As H.H., I did the murders. You're serious, I see. What is the hypothesis? For years, you've harboured murderous feelings against your ex, Monica, and Mary, her mum. They despised you, looked down on you, sent you up, emasculated you. You took it on the chin like a man, but deep in your unconscious, you indulged in fantasies of revenge. The two women seemed impregnable behind real castle walls. Also, their attitude to you, you believed, had undermined your self-confidence until you began to fail as a soldier. That was the nail in their coffin. For you loved the army before anything. But revenge is better than murder. Only murderers get found out, so horrible Harry came into being. He could do it and not be found out. The point is, 
that although you would kill as your duty as a soldier, you are not a murderer by natural inclination, and your code of behaviour discounts such a thing. So you know about killing people, consciously, and unconsciously you know about the desire to murder. No wonder H.H. was produced. I'm terrified, Joanna, frozen. Is it possible that I was possessed by my own shadow? Just now you claim that you were possessed. You now ask me if you could have been. Oh, there's no logic about this. I have no memory of doing anything, but... All right, yes, the unconscious can invade and possess the conscious. It accounts for some types of insanity. Could this happen to me again? If it did happen to you before, I suppose it could happen to you again. In that last dream, H.H. was absolutely real and different. The come in, dear boy stuff, like an old pal... Before, we kept our distance, didn't we? What do I do next? What can I tell you? However, you said that the murders were committed after 11 at night. What did you do that evening? Oh, I've been into that. I went to dinner with some friends, Tim and Liz. She's pregnant, having a rough time. I left early, around 10. Plenty of time to drive to Rushforth by 11-ish. And you did that? I don't remember doing so. I thought I'd driven home. Have you found blood on your clothes or in the car? Oh, I've looked, not a trace. What about the car, petrol, mileage? No idea. I didn't check at the time, of course. Joanna, what the hell do I do now? Stop believing that you did the foul deeds. My theorising is what it is, a fiction. You couldn't jump in and out of H.H.'s skin, as it were, without severely damaging your psyche. If you turned balmy that night, you'd still be balmy. And the last thing you'd do in that case would be to confess. Then my dream of the murders was coincidence. I think it was prophetic. How or why, I don't know yet. Prophetic? That goes well with possession, doesn't it? I don't know. If you still think you're guilty, what are you going to do about your guilt? I shall go to the police at Rushforth. I'll find out what they think, then I'll make a statement. I must know the truth. How can I take patience on until I know the truth? And if the police agree, if you see what I mean, that I was the murderer, mad or not, the sooner the world knows about it, the better. And Patty can be looked after by others. I have tried to tell you the truth, Harry. All right, find it out in your own way, if you must. Afternoon, Davies. Afternoon, sir. Busy boys, are we? There's a military bird waiting in the drawing room. I thought you'd better see him, sir. He's family. Oh, yes. Colonel Harry Meadows, ex-husband. Oh, yes, I know. I know a lot about Colonel Meadows. So he's turned up, has he? Shall I uh, get him in, sir? No, no. I'll, uh, I'll use the drawing room for our chat. Since we've got a place like this as HQ, why not use its, uh, its charming facilities? What's he like? Big and tough. <laughs> Typical regular army officer in my book. Except he seems sort of uh, dreamy. Off with us. Is he? Interesting. Right. Oh, and see we get some tea in about half an hour, will you? Bring it myself, sir. Great. Colonel Meadows. Yes, that's me. Good. I'm Detective Superintendent Miller. And my detective sergeant uh, told you that I'm in charge of things, I believe? Yes, he did. May I offer you my sympathy, Colonel? Um... Oh, yes, thanks. I'm glad you've called. I'm sure that a chat will be useful. Yes. Uh, can we sit down? Why not? <laughs> Lovely room, this, isn't it? Yes. Yes, I, I suppose it is. I'm told that nobody was allowed to smoke in it. No, it was a house rule. The fabrics hold the smell. Oh, so that's it, is it? I wondered why. Although today, of course, smoking is becoming a, an antisocial activity in the eyes of many. Yes. I puff at a pipe on occasions. Yes, I must say I enjoy a cigar now and again. Yes, I'll smoke a cigar, if offered. Is, um, is your daughter remaining at school, Colonel? Patience? Yes, but I'll take her off soon. Was hoping to. Your little friends will rally around her there, I'm sure. She rings me. She's all right. Well, that's one thing. I thought you'd asked to see me. I was getting round to it, sir. There's been a lot to do, though. Yes, of course. 
Is anybody helping you with your inquiries? Not yet. They will be soon. I'm fairly confident of that, sir. Yes. It's very difficult to get away with murder, isn't it? With this sort of murder, yes. The random sort, the, the Yorkshire Ripper variety, oh, that's another matter. Well, that sort of chap is mad, though, isn't he? I mean, not clinically, perhaps, but not rational, not normal. I'll leave that to the head shrinker, sir. It's <laughs> a good nickname, head shrinker. Mm. They reduce the swollen-headed ego to its right size. No, I don't know much about it, Colonel. Tell me, sir, um, did you... Uh, did you know the staff here? Well, by sight and name, that was all. Except for Atwell, who was once with my battalion. Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. Do you know why they were murdered, Mr... Miller, Colonel Meadows? I think I do, but um, I have to verify one or two things before I can be sure. Were they being robbed? You mean, uh, did they surprise a person in the process of committing a robbery, do you, sir? Yes, something of the sort. No, no, no. No, a robbery wasn't the motive. No, no I, I didn't think. I, I don't know what your ideas about a motive are, but I have my own idea. Do you, sir? Of course, sir, you knew both women well, and one was your, your ex-wife. I wish I'd known them well. Somebody was taking their revenge, is my theory. In a way, that's my theory also, sir. Probably we have the same chap in mind. Yes, quite likely. Both women knew him well, that goes without saying. True. As far as it goes. What do you mean by that? Well, my chap wasn't the sort of chap they, uh, the victims would ever know really well. The class barrier would uh, would get in the way. Yes. Yes, I think that's true. My chap didn't ever take to that, felt he was being looked down on, that sort of thing. Of course. But the younger woman was rather, um, um, how can I put it, um, dominated by him, I suspect. Uh, sexual matters. Uh... Once, yes. But that had grown cold on both sides. Had it, sir? Oh, that's something I... Uh... I hadn't reckoned with. Well, I should have thought it was obvious. Mm -hmm. No, there was something else, something different. My chap was sure both women had messed up his life. It drove him balmy, eventually. So, you reckon that your chap was round the twist when he did the murders? Like a man possessed. In fact, he was a man possessed. And I'll tell you something else about him. A couple of weeks before the murders, he dreamed of murdering two women, a queen and a princess. He dreamt that he, or least a brother of himself, stabbed the two women to death. Tea has ordered, Governor. Yeah, yeah. The staff has the afternoon off. Yeah. I'll, I'll do the pouring. First time I've seen a large DS mincing around with a silver tray. <laughs> we always chose small other ranks as mess waiters. They did less harm to the furniture. Haven't touched a thing, sir. Will that be all, gentlemen? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Davis. Yes. Right, oh. Colonel Meadows. Let's pour your cup. How do you know about the dreams, sir? A cake. They're homemade and they're very good. But you know that, of course. I'm on a diet, but um, I'll have a cake. Your chap told you of the dream, I suppose? He spoke of it, yes. It was a worrying dream. He had to speak of it. Delicious, his cake. Mm. Tell me more about your chap. I'm, I'm not entirely au fait with the way the tactics my chap employed to carry out the object of the exercise. Uh, he drove down from London right enough that evening, got here about 11.30. Probably the servants were in bed, certainly off duty. But Atwell opened the door to my chap nevertheless and let him in, as he would. As he would? Atwell knew my chap, and my chap held rank over Atwell. Oh, did he? Go on, Colonel. Well, once inside, my chap sent Atwell packing. He heard the old countess pushing herself around in her wheelchair upstairs and wondering who it was arriving so late. My chap went up the stairs, slipped into the alcove, the, the one with that Gainsborough of the grounds in it, oh. and waited for the wheelchair to come past him on its way to Lady Monica's room. When it did, he got behind it and stabbed the Countess just once, as he'd been trained to do. She died with no more than an intake of breath. Her, her daughter was probably in bed. She heard her mother wheelchairing around, so got up and opened her bedroom door and was confronted by my chap, 
a short bayonet in his hand, and her mother slumped in the chair. He killed her before she could cry out, again with one stab to the heart, caught her so she didn't crash down, and laid her on the bed. After that, he went to her bathroom, washed up a bit. There was only a little blood on his hands. Cleaned the bayonet, and giving himself time, making sure the house was quiet, let himself out and drove back to London. Drink your tea, sir. I want another cup. Yes, right away. Do you expect me to arrest you on that statement, sir? I can't see why not. It's a perfectly good confession. You said your chap was eventually driven by me. Are you telling me that you're off your rocker? Not now. At the time, yes. I was possessed by my shadow ego figure. The one I had dreams about. An autonomous complex we christened Horrible Harry as he is my ugly half. God save the Queen. You said we've christened? The psychoanalyst I go to. Have you told him this story? It's a her. Yes. And what did she say? She said it was a good theory, but it couldn't have happened. If you were possessed when you did it, how do you remember what you did now? I don't. Not a thing. I'm only sure that that's the way it would have happened, did happen. You're telling me a fiction then, sir. I can't arrest on a fiction. We've not got an iota of evidence against you. Well, Apwell must have let me in. We'll ask him that, sir. Of course, uh, you could have done it, I grant you, but uh, there's my own chap to consider first. I, I thought your chap was me. And I thought your chap was my chap. I need to investigate my chap first, sir. Give me a day or so, and I'll get round to your claim. Go back to London, stay there, and I'll be in touch. All right. This isn't exactly how I visualise things. Never mind. I see your point. Don't keep me hanging around too long, though, will you? Th there is my daughter to consider. Yes. Yes, there is. I'll do my best, sir. Is he a nutter, Governor? How the hell do I know? I didn't ask him for the name of his witch doctor, it reminds me. Not to worry for the he moment. He left it on the way out, wrote it down. It doesn't beat things undone, doesn't Colonel Meadows? The old thing is, Davis, he could have done it. What evidence do we have to the contrary? At well, sir. Ah, we shall see. Meadows' story's good. It's wrong on some details, but it's good. Is it an invention, and doesn't he remember? But if it's not an invention, sir, but he does remember, even though he says he doesn't, why get the details wrong? As an insurance, perhaps? He wants us to think he was balmy, anything. Oh. But um, he obviously thoroughly disliked his ex and her mum. Probably they treated him like dirt. Proud man, true. So, he could have gone round the twist, and he would know how to use the bayonet efficient. And the women know him. So even late at night and the unexpected call, they wouldn't fear him, wouldn't be on their guard. Unless... Unless what, sir? We must find out if anybody overheard threats. Or was there ever any violence? Yes, did, did Colonel Harry ever give Lady Monica a belting or tip up the old lady's wheelchair? <laughs> I doubt it, but we better give it a whirl. And that well, sir? I'll tackle him. When he arrives, have no fear... And I've told Meadows to stay in London. We'd better ask the Yard to keep an eye on him, you never know. Oh, Colonel Meadows. Evening, Mrs Taylor. I don't like to appear inquisitive, but there's been a young lady. Well, girl, really, ringing your bell. When was this? Since about six. An hour or so ago, anyway. Well, I think I know who it is. Thank you, Mrs Taylor. Not at all. I thought I should say. Oh, my Colonel. There she is. Daddy, Daddy. Patience. Patty! I tried to phone you. I've been out all day. What's happened? Well, they let me come away. School. Miss Standish thought it best. Trouble? No, just that, well, nobody could talk of anything else. Being the centre of attraction has its disadvantages. I've been nowhere until today. It was jolly ghoulish. Well, you must be exhausted. Come on. And hungry. I am, a bit. What a nice flat it is, Daddy. Of course, you've never been here, have you? Wasn't allowed. 
I was planned to sneak away and come here. <laughs> All hell would have been let loose. Oh, poor old mummy. Poor, really, old grandmama. Do you believe it all, Daddy? That they are dead? Yes. I still can't properly understand that it's for real. Oh, I've got that far, all right. But I've had more experience of sudden death than you. Not surprisingly. I couldn't stop crying. Thinking, the other night, how they might have felt, what they did. Stupid thing. I know. But there is no knowing, Patty. I don't think we should talk about it tonight. Not yet. Let time heal. It does. Yes. Pax, until you say. <laughs> it's funny. What is? Well, I mean, most girls at Blade see their fathers much more than I ever saw you. Well, I should hope so. But, well, I wonder if as many get on as well as we do. Some do. Some not. I think we're rather alike. And that's quite a help. We don't have to be on parade all the time. <laughs> not like at Rushforth most of the time. Oh. Daddy? Mm-hmm. When all this is settled, I'll be able to be with you, won't I? That's a point. All things being equal, yes. Oh, equal? Well, why shouldn't they be? Oh, sorry, darling. I was putting it clumsily. I, I, I was thinking of the Bradenhams, that great horde. But you come before them, Daddy. Of course, yes, I know. Well, Grandmama wasn't a bad old sort, and she was very brave. All that pain and not a word. But the rest of them, not Mummy, but the others... They're awful, Daddy. They're bullies and they're very stupid. Yes, I know. I'll take you on. And anyway, they wouldn't want you, I bet. <laughs> I give them absolute hell. You know, I think you would. <laughs> oh, dear, I suddenly got tired. <laughs> then you'd better suddenly go to bed, or suddenly better go to bed. <laughs> Good morning. Or rather, afternoon. Oh, dear, dear, what time is it? Thought I'd let you sleep in. The clock is correct. Oh, I did just that, didn't I? See, 12. You needed to sleep, obviously. You want an egg? Please. I'm hungry again. Growing girl. Did you sleep well, Daddy? Yes, funnily enough, very. You mean, no nasty man dreams? Uh, you know about them, of course. I've forgotten mm. you did. No, I think old Horrible has been banished. I had rather a decent dream, actually. Maisie Hitchin at school has the most extraordinarily erotic dreams, according to her. My efforts at any sort of dream are pretty feeble, although I did dream of Mummy the other night as if nothing had happened. When I was at Rushforth, I often had fairly unpleasant dreams around Atwell. Atwell? Yeah. Well, I'd better get that. Watch the egg. How much on the timer? Oh, under a minute. Cornflakes, I think. Daddy does keep everything neat and tidy. Like a good soldier should. He should have a girlfriend. Oh, hello. You're a detective. Detective Superintendent Miller, Miss Meadows. Where did you meet, for heaven's sake? Oh, Mr. Miller came down to the school and grilled me. Oh, my eggs done. Do you mind if I eat a late breakfast while you're here, Mr. Miller? Of course not. And I never grilled you. You grilled me, more to the truth. Well, I must have known things. <laughs> Didn't you, Arthur? Uh? Still, you were very useful. Eyes and ears like a lynx the girl has. Hear that, Daddy? Oh, sorry, I'm being much too flippant. I don't really feel flippant. Oh, dear, it's hard-boiled. Never mind. Have you arrested anybody yet, Mr. Miller? Yes, uh, I have, Miss Meadows. Good. I bet I know who it is. Yes, you well might. For God's sake, Miller, get it over and done with. Daddy, what? For some odd reason, Miss Meadows, your father thinks that I've come to arrest him. Arrest? Oh, Daddy, why? You couldn't... He thought he couldn't, he had, believe it or not. You see, Paddy, I had a dream, a, a number of dreams. One of them was of a double murder, before the murders. Oh, darling, is that all? You and your old dreams. Did you think you were balmy or something? More or less, yes. Oh, Daddy... So, who have you arrested, Mr. Miller? What was your guess, Miss Meadows? was not a guess. It was a surmise. Atwell. That's him. Atwell? We brought him back and charged him last night. Your egg's getting cold, Miss. Oh, I don't mind cold-boiled eggs, actually. It uh, surprises you, doesn't it, sir? Yes, but more than surprised. You're sure about it? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I was from the beginning. Although you did throw a small spanner in the wigs... Yeah, he was missing when the murders came to light, and, uh, well, there, there were other things. 
Why did he do such a thing, if he did? He's made a long statement, sir. He felt he was ill-used. I know a lot about it, Daddy. I couldn't say. Not them. Your daughter will enlighten you, sir. Now, I must be gone. I only dropped in to put your mind at rest. Uh, look after him, Miss Meadows. Good luck, sir. I'll see myself out. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Well, Patty. Tell. Oh, it was pretty ghastly. I can't think what came over, Mummy. I mean, I knew she was sexy and all that, but to carry on with the underbutler was just a bad joke. She was having an affair with that, well? Afraid so, Daddy. How did you find out? Well, I sort of sensed it at first. And then I kept my eyes and ears open, and then I came across him in the greenhouse. Bloody silly woman. Sorry. Didn't you ever notice anything? I was hardly ever there. Once I thought he was hanging about the room for too long, that's all. Mummy was infatuated with him for a while. When he came into the room, you could tell. Of course, he was smart. Cock a hoop. Well, he had a reputation with the ladies when he was with the regiment. What about Grandma Mary? Oh, she knew all right. I'm sure she must have. She used to smile as if she thought it amusing. So long as Atwell wasn't asking to sit down as one of the family. And that's it. I think he wanted to be family. <laughs> Foolish lad. Marriage? Well, I overheard Mummy and him rhyme once, last time I was home. She said... I'd be more likely to marry back the something nursery man than you, you oaf. <laughs> I think she'd gone off him by then. It was difficult to get rid of, I'm sure. Oh, that last time I was home was awful. Terrible. That will always seem to be lurking around. In the corridor, on the stairs, just outside the door. Even in the grounds, he'd be on the other side of the wall, behind the corner of the Rose Arbor. That sounds remarkably like the way my dream chap used to behave. How extraordinary. Were you dreaming, Atwell? I must find out. And Grandmama? Oh, something I overheard. I think she was going to sack him. So he lost his head? <laughs> it's as if Mummy and Grandma were tempting fate without knowing that they were, isn't it? Victims are made, not born. You don't believe that you did it, do you? Not anymore. No, no, not anymore. In the cold light of day, it all seems splendiferously crazy, Patty Love. <laughs> but at the time, oh, those dreams were so real, so absolutely powerful, that I lived in their light. And they were telling me something so obvious. I couldn't see for looking. So, now for poor Joanna. She had better know the facts. And you had better come with me to tell her. Okay. By hindsight, it's all reasonable and logical. But how on the wrong track I was. Why did I take Atwell to my unconscious heartland, Joanna? Probably because you were responsible for him. Was I? Grandma used to say he was your creature, Daddy, when it suited her. I recommended him for the job, yes. It's true. I did feel responsible in the sense that I hoped he was satisfactory, only that. Consciously, yes. But your unconscious is a very deep and very active lake, Harry. It must have grasped that you had created a potentially dangerous situation. I suppose H.H. grew out of the guilt of that knowledge as much as anything. Well, I certainly put the enemy in position without knowing what the hell I was doing. Then I believe that your training as an infantry officer set up alarms in the unconscious. The years of training worked. You sense danger as a soldier does when others don't. I must say, Daddy's unconscious seems jolly clever and jolly devious. And his conscious jolly stupid and jolly simple. So, Daddy wasn't just dreaming at her. Autonomous complexes are fragmentary personalities. The kind of creatures a writer plucks from his experience. Perhaps a person only seen for a moment. And then has to make real by his imagination. Complexes are made real by the unconscious, autonomously. I see that. Patty said that Monica and her mother were perhaps tempting fate, making themselves victims. You said that last. I know. But my God, how I helped them. I put an ambitious, callous womanizer into a community of two or three women just like that. In the normal course of events, that wouldn't have been much of a problem. I should have thought of Monica's vulnerability, the sexual thing. Why didn't Grandma stop her, do you think? She could have. But honestly, she seemed only amused. This sounds priggish, probably, but it's true. Sometimes the people of your grandmama's world will accept almost anything to alleviate the boredom of their lives. Yes. She once told me she was bored beyond belief. Hmm. So, Harry, I think your ugly man was created by a form of guilt. He was made to show how the combination of Atwell and the two women was a disaster area. Hence the prophetic dream of murder stark warning that we interpreted wrongly. Jung said we ignore the unconscious at our peril. 
I'd add to that that we misinterpret its meaning at our peril also. Mm. On the other hand, could we have stopped anything? Perhaps, if Daddy had known what was going on at Rushforth, then... Would Monica have listened to me? Not on your life. Or her own life. If Hilda hadn't died so inconveniently. She was on the right track from her notes, I'm sure. So many ifs, as always. It's like it was all destined. I mean, fate, which Daddy's dreams saw beforehand, but couldn't stop. No, oh, you're so right, young lady, so right. Atwell must have hated them, you know. They could be ghastly cruel, totally heartless, without an ounce of compassion. His sort of chap would not be capable of taking much of their treatment without striking back. I don't only feel guilt for the victims, but also for their murderer. Please, Daddy, that's no good. It won't help. I know, Patty. But I have to acknowledge it to get over it, which I shall, with your help. <laughs> <sighs> I've taken a bit of a bashing, haven't I? <laughs> well, you can laugh. I'm a different chap to what I was six months ago. I can see my late self quite clearly, you know. As a new man, Harry, you have somewhere to begin from and somewhere to go. And what about that overactive unconscious, Dr. White? Do we still have to put up with that? I'd better start looking for a job. That's a joke today, isn't it? Afraid so, Patience. The overactive unconscious is all part of your father's makeup. Tell me, can children inherit a father's unconscious, plus a couple of his complexes and a few of his nasty dreams? In The Autonomous Murder Complex by Frederick Bradnam, the part of Harry Meadows was played by Robin Ellis, Joanna White by Bridget Turner, and Hilda Gertzand by Catherine Wilmer. Atwell, William Nye, Lady Monica, Francis Jeter, the Dowager Countess, Pauline Letts, and Patience by Tamsin Collison. Detective Superintendent Miller, Hugh Dixon, Detective Sergeant Davis, Alan Dudley, Inspector Oakes, Stephen Thorne, Thanet, Ronald Herdman, Judith Smart, Rosalind Adams, Diana, Stella Forge, Alf, John Livesey. With Stephen Garlick, Crawford Logan, Andrew Seacombe, Teresa Stratfield, and Patience Tomlinson. The play was directed by Jane Morgan. <laughs>